Hello. Uh, I decided since I'm going to be doing um, the restorative library meetup on drawing today that I would record a little video for those of you who can't make it for whatever reasons. Um, it won't be the same because one of the points of these sessions is to be in community doing the activities, but I thought it could be nice to have a little bit of like lead instruction on some of the activities as a way to, um, one, help me prepare for the talk, or it's not a talk, prepare for the meetup, and two, to give something to those who can't come who want to kind of learn more about these tools. So essentially, I guess what I want to share is that the goal of the meetup and, um, and hopefully, you know, maybe a little bit about this meeting is, or this video, is to, um, it's kind of twofold. And the first goal is just to understand or at least be exposed to the idea, um, if you haven't already, that to work from a place of wholeness is, um, is what I think will ultimately be um, the point of all this restorative library stuff. So we want to... Um, we want to recognize that it's stressful work and um, and I guess one approach to that that we've seen a lot is self-care um, and mindfulness and, and things like that, which in and of themselves aren't, um, aren't wrong, but they're insufficient because the problems are not individual problems. They're um, systemic problems, but systemic problems play out oftentimes in individual interactions. So it's just really kind of gnarly. And, um, and so my takeaway from my dissertation in this work is the importance of working in a space where we feel like we can be whole. And what whole essentially means is alive. And, um, and so this is sort of um, inspired by Christopher Alexander's work um, in, in a, a series of books called The Nature of Order and his observations about what makes spaces feel kind of alive and special and what makes spaces feel sort of dead <laughs> and that the whole world works that way and we are part of that world. And so when we can work from a place where we feel more alive, um, what, do we, what do we make, how do we work, and what does that solve in the system um, that is sort of macro and micro over and over again reinforcing itself. So that said, uh, one of the things that seems to be critically important in working from a place of wholeness is feeling safe. And feeling safe is uh, not something that we necessarily feel without fear. So one of the things I think drawing is particularly wonderful at is helping us feel safe and afraid at the same time. And so drawing as a tool for expressing, communicating, ideating, designing is critical. And those skills will come. But before you can get to skill building at drawing, especially drawing in a kind of workerly way, you need to feel safe enough to draw. And you may already, but you may not. And so here are th three ways that I, I want to kind of um, su suggest and show are, are, are very effective ways to fill both of those things at the same time because they're very low stakes, but they, they're like surprisingly scary sometimes. Uh, anyway, at least for me, and I feel like I can draw some and draw a lot and still scary every time. So it's, it's really fruitful in that way. So the three ways are squiggles, um, shapes, and seeing. I thought I 
to go with a little alliteration here. So these map directly to activities in the guidebook, um, squiggle birds, uh, visual, alphabet, and zen of seeing. So these are three activities in the drawing set. Um, so what we will do on the call um, is we will practice drawing squiggles, turning them into things. We'll practice drawing shapes, picking a shape and just drawing it over and over again and noticing how we feel, what we notice in our body um, as we do so. And then actually doing a Zen of Seeing activity on Zoom with each other so that we can, um, we can uh, experience being drawn and also drawing someone else and if comfortable sharing that um, with the group. So <clears throat> essentially, you know, I'll do a quick, a quick version of these things. You know, a squiggle might look like that. Um, and let's just draw some of the shapes here. Three of the easy starter shapes in the visual vocabulary or visual alphabet, I can't remember which one I called it, are those three shapes. I'm gonna get a different color marker here. So if we take these three shapes and we turn this into a bird, and maybe we have a mama bird right here. You can see I'm doing the carrot there. Yeah, it's a big beak on that baby bird. See how I did lines and carrots here. Um, we draw a bird. That's how we do a squiggle bird. We could also do a squiggle robot or a squiggle puppy. Those three things, birds, puppies, and robots, I've found over the years to be most fruitful in this, this particular um, squiggle interpretation, let's call it. Um, but what is interesting about this activity? So this is fun because it helps you to see. And like, for example, you could always just say, like a little baby bird. Say this if, if it's a little confusing. Um, but I, um, I think what's interesting about this, let's do a completely different kind of squiggle, is that figuring out where to place the eye in this situation um, is, is, uh, is always a moment of fear. Uh, but it doesn't matter what we're doing here, especially if you're not being videotaped, right? So this moment of fear is right here. And that's practice. So, you know, as I continue to draw this bird, I have these, these little heartbeat racings and, 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 and just a little bit of practice of, of, of conquering fear. And that is the magic behind this activity. So uh, the second activity, uh, shapes, is to extend the visual vocabulary to all the shapes in it. And I don't remember them all, but I'm going to just do some here. Angle and let's do spiral. All right, there are 12. Here's nine of 12. I, the three that I forgot, I think house and something else. Oh, this thing here. Um, so, you know how it is when you have a list, you always forget one. This is so perfect. Okay, right here. I was going to pick um, triangle because it's similar for me, but this has a triangle in it and it is just the best. Okay, so. For me, I'm drawing these shapes, <clears throat> and I have experience while I draw the shapes. I'm not just drawing the shapes void of emotion and thoughts. And as I do, I notice this one here I'm discontent with, uh, and I'm always discontent with this shape. So I usually start my triangles at the top, go down, over, and up. And with this, it makes it an even longer journey. And in that journey, something happens to my hand. It's a lack of confidence, I think. I'm not exactly sure. But it starts to get wiggly, and it happens a lot um, for me. And so I think what's interesting is to just pick one of these shapes that causes you a little trepidation. And just expose yourself to it. 
draw it over and over again, draw it from different points and see what kinds of emotions get lived and expressed and, and pulse through you. Um, you know, we're not seeking to do some sort of, you know, emotional calisthenics around stressing ourselves out. Um, and if that's where you are with this, then don't do those things. But if it feels manageable in the scope of like, you know, what it is, which is a very low stakes activity in reality, then go for it. Find something that feels a little, a little stuck and move it like you would in a physical therapist's office. <laughs> but it's an emotion that you're moving through. So that's shapes. And then the last thing here is seeing. And <clears throat> this one is, uh, is, is, like I said, a card you can read all about, Frederick Frank and Zen of Seeing. And I highly encourage you to pick up the book. I think it's a really lovely um, publication. Um, essentially, what the Zen of Seeing is, is it's an activity that technically slows you down in, um, in a moment. And from Frederick Frank's point of view, it's an activity that helps you see, um, helps you use seeing as a vessel or vehicle to, um, to, to transcendence. So you can actually, at the kind of like extreme of this activity, become, um, become the thing that you're seeing. That's his, that's his book's thesis, let's call it. Um, <clears throat> so here I have this wonderful little puppy dog, um, Lewis, and I am going to draw him without looking at this board. And, um, and I think the Zen of Seeing activities, there is something there transcendent. Um, I have been doing this activity for over 10 years. And I remember the very early days and all throughout the experience, every once in a while, having a moment of surprising myself with what happened in that noticing, that episode of noticing, let's call it. Um, and because of that, I encourage you where possible, I think a nice ramp on ramp to that experience is to draw living things that are like technically biologically living. So Lewis is a great, a great starting point, a, um, a flower or a blade of grass or clouds, even just something that's got movement and life in it, fire. Um, and then you can move on to more objects that are less obviously living. Um, but I, I think it's just really nice to start with something living. You can, do this watching a video on YouTube, or I think the best way to do it is when you're on the train or a bus or in uh, on a bench looking at people walking by, that kind of thing is a great activity. So <clears throat> this is what it looks like. <clears throat> Excuse me. So ideally, I'm not going to do this for the video because it would make it kind of boring um, <laughs> if it's not already, <laughs> but I am going to um, normally just spend a few minutes looking at Lewis without drawing him, just to sort of settle myself and just kind of get into a place of quiet. And then once I'm there, I'm going to take my pen or pencil uh, and I'm just going to plop it on the paper, okay? Lewis is alert because he hears a... Um... <laughs> He's moving nicely, but this is great because <clears throat> it allows me... <laughs> He's so good. <laughs> oh, it's a, it's a car going by. Okay, so we lost Lewis, but we get to the start. And here, I guess, is, is a great example of... I'll, I'll go let him out while you look at this. A great... Hold on. Why don't you go say hello? No, you don't want to go out. Okay. Oh, a dog. He just wants to sit and bark, I think. So <clears throat> this is a great example of what this sort of activity produces, which is essentially nonsense. Um, you're, not, you're not at all caring about the drawing. You're caring about 
the drawing. So you're not caring about the noun, the drawing, you're caring about the verb, the drawing. You're just in that moment caring about looking at the thing that you're looking at and etching the contours of that with letting go completely of what the actual product is. Um, and so this can be a really nice way to, again, practice that moment of unknown, um, actually making a commitment, putting something on a page, knowing it's not going to be any good and doing anyway, letting go of the desire to produce, the desire to make good, um, that sort of thing. It's a wonderful practice in that way. So essentially that is the, uh, the session for today. At the end, I hope to encourage folks and I encourage you as well to do one of the listening activities, especially if you're interested in the next meetup, which is going to be about um, seeing how these little, little things like this and the listening activities can lead to bigger things. And we're going to do some brainstorming about that. So a really nice prep for the next meetup will be to do some listening. And there are three different activities for that. And you can explore them on the website. Thank you so much for watching, if you did, and uh, I'll maybe see you next time.